I would like to welcome everyone to the second colloquium of our, um, of our year. Um, and again, we're online, of course, but we're looking forward to meeting in person in the spring, though hopefully we could find one of you this sort of uh, broadcast the events at the same time, if we can work that out. Um, today, we welcome um, a very interesting and a speaker who's made important contributions to the theory of mm, alternatives to capitalism, let me put it that way. Not sure if I should say democratic socialism or not. We'll see from his talk. Uh, Martin O'Neill uh, is a professor of philosophy at political philosophy at the University of York. Um, and he has written a number of important books and articles, um, including a collection that received a lot of attention on property owning democracy, Rawls and Beyond in 2012. Uh, another book uh, on taxation, Philosophical Perspectives from Oxford in 2018. And uh, more recent, most recently, I guess, I'm not sure, maybe Martin, you want to update this with another book, but I know that anyway, the, uh, the case for community wealth building with Joe Guinan that came out from Politic Press in 2019. <clears throat> he also <clears throat> contributed to the Stanford Encyclopedia Philosophy article, was it on socialism, Martin, with Pablo Gilabert? Pablo, yeah. Very important article. And, um, and he is a co-editor of an issue uh, which we all hope will come out since <laughs> I have a paper in it too, on socialism for philosophical, is it issues or topics? I'm I, I, I think it's topics. Uh, topics, yes. Yeah. Topic. There's another one that's issues, but okay. So yeah, that's all waiting to come out. And this paper is actually Martin's contribution to that, uh, to that collection, uh, to that special issue, which should um, receive a lot of attention. Um, he's addressing this very important problem, of course, of the problems with capitalism and what reasonable alternatives and uh, possible alternatives and effective alternatives would be to it. And he's been an advocate to this point of, I think, of a, at least a variant or a continuation of Rawls's uh, notion of property owning democracy. But we'll see from the talk today, which is entitled Social Justice and Economic Systems on Rawls, Democratic Socialism and Alternatives to Capitalism. And we welcome Martin, thank you so much for coming. Thank, thanks very much indeed, Carol. It's a, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here and I'm, I'm very grateful for the invitation and thanks very much as well to, to Patricia for the very uh, very uh, effective organizational uh, work behind the scenes as well. You, you can imagine how uh, how delightful it was to get an invitation to CUNY because uh, I got the email and thought oh fantastic after all we've been through a trip to New York that will put a great thing to look forward to. <laughs> next year, next year. <laughs> So, but but even on Zoom, even on Zoom, it's nice. So I, I've blurred my background because I'm in my son's bedroom, which is a bit messy. So uh, it's you know it, it it will have to do. So <laughs> I will um, share my screen. I've made some uh, some slides here. Um, and, um, that's good. You. Hopefully that's that's visible. So um, so as Carol says, I'm I'm going to. Um, Oh, by the way, what, what time am I, uh, how long have I got, by the way? Um, well, what do you think? Like 40, 45 minutes? Is that Quite good? good. That and, sounds... and another 45 for our discussion. Perfect. Perfect. Or so. Good. I'll, I'll try not to go, I'll try not to be more verbose than that. So um, what I want to do is to um, try, and, try and sort of talk about the question of what kind of economic system would realise Rawls's two principles of justice. So, um, as Carol said, I, I did some work um, over the last sort of decade or so on the idea of uh, property owning democracy. And actually Carol was, was instrumental in, in giving some of that work uh, a platform in a, um, a special issue or a, or a symposium that we had in the Journal of Social Philosophy uh, back in 2008 uh, with Tad Williamson and uh, uh, Nian Hei Shea and, and the late Wahid Hussain as well. 
Um, and I, I guess there's been, you know, sort of set of debates that have developed since then, trying to think about Rawls's idea of property owning democracy, or trying to think a little bit as well about um, the other alternative system that he doesn't talk so much about, his idea of liberal socialism. Now, I've, I've come to the view um, that despite, uh, despite the fact that some of these debates are, are now quite well developed, that actually some of these debate, debates really aren't in good order at all. And that it's been much too schematic and we need to, if we're really serious about trying to think about, um, trying to think about the institutional demands of uh, something like Rawlsian uh, principles of justice, we need to take a couple of steps back before we can move forward again. So I think we, we just don't face a simple choice between property owning democracy and liberal socialism in the way that Rawls sets things up. And that, you know, if, if you're someone like me who thinks that Rawls's account of the principles of social justice is, you know, remains the most powerful uh, account available, I think the discussion that Rawls gives us of the economic implications of his account just leaves a lot to be desired and has left a bit of a, a bit of a shadow over the uh, discussions of institutions that we might have. So what I want to do is, um, in, in some ways, this is a, an attempt to clear some ground and just to kind of, to try and sort of re-describe some of the territory a little bit so that we can then, then advance. Um, not least because I think, you know, and this is something I'll, I'll uh, talk about at the start, when Rawls talks about the choice between capitalism and socialism, his focus is very much on the question of ownership of, of productive resources. It puts that right at the center of the, the question. But I think there's a range of questions that we need to think, think about, about economic democracy, about decommodification and the limits of markets, on the role and extent and the proper, uh, the proper kinds of democratic planning of the economy that we ought to have. And none of those axes are well captured just by focusing on ideas of ownership. So I think Rawls's way of setting things up kind of sends us a little bit in, in the wrong direction. So what I want to do really today is to sort of go over, um, go over um, these sort of four areas um, and to talk about ways in which actually thinking about the kinds of institutional structure that might, uh, that might allow us to, to live together under, under fair terms, as free and equal uh, people kind of bring us into a, a broader set of normative questions than the ones that Rawls puts into play when he talks about the choice between uh, between uh, property and democracy as a basically, you know, private property economic system or liberal socialism as a uh, as uh, an economic system that that puts state or that puts public ownership or some some form of um, whether state ownership or some other form of, of uh, public ownership at, at, at the centre of the economy. Um, and my sort of background aim here is that I'm looking for, it's, an, it's a sort of, it's an ironic project to bring peace uh, between liberal egalitarians and democratic socialists, right? I think there's more common ground than either might think. If anyone goes on Twitter, then you know that, you know, people on the left normally use the term liberal as something like uh, a slur or a term of abuse. <laughs> and... You know, maybe maybe that's not inappropriate given the way that some socialist ideas have been discussed in the liberal egalitarian tradition. But I think you know that there's more in common than than either tradition might think. And so I've got a bit of a, a project of reconciliation here. Now, if at the end of this you tell me that this is just a completely quixotic project and that this reconciliation won't work, well, perhaps. But at least I'll have, I'll have tried. When I talk to my my more radical students about the idea of liberal socialism, they they think I've made a category error, um, and that I, I clearly don't know what I'm uh, what I'm on about. So we'll we'll see whether that's right or not. So the four areas I want to talk about is um, the way that questions about economic democracy complicate the picture, the, the sort of ownership based picture that the rule starts with. Um, I want to talk about the normative case for a mixed economy. So insofar as I want to defend a particular sort of proposal here, um, I want to make the case for why we need market and, uh, and sort of um, collective non-market institutions and why the mix of the two is very important. I want to talk a little bit about decommodification and then a little bit about democratic planning. So it's a, it's a bit of a whistle-stop tour and I will... Um, I hope at least kind of open some questions that we can get further into in the discussion. This is very much a paper that's trying to 
clear clear ground and, and do some some mapping rather than maybe to, to go into as much detail um, as I'll hope to do at some other some other point. So the familiar or you know hopefully what's now a familiar story is that Rawls rejects the capitalist welfare state as he thinks that it can't uh, it can't realize the fair value of the political liberties or fair equality of opportunity or anything like the difference principle. You can't have economic um, reciprocity uh, with institutions like a capitalist welfare state. And so says rules, uh, you either, you need to choose, you need to make a choice between a property owning democracy, which is a, 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 a private, uh, a, a, a sort of a, a market economy with uh, mostly characterized by uh, by private ownership of productive resources, but very broadly dispersed, or a form of liberal liberal socialism. So Rawls says in, in Justice and Fairness, both a property-owning democracy and a liberal socialist regime set up a constitutional framework for democratic politics. They guarantee the basic liberties with the fair value of the political liberties and fair equality of opportunity, and they regulate economic and social inequalities by a principle of mutuality, if not by the Different principle itself, so that you know they get you close to a sort of justifiable economic distribution. Well, what's the difference between those two kinds of regimes on Rawls's view? Well, it, it's quite simple. It's, it's about the ownership of the uh, the means of production. So, property-owning democracy is about the broad dispersal of ownership and control of the means of production, whereas liberal socialism involves, on Rawls's view, the broad dispersal of control alongside, presumably, the socialization of, of ownership. So as I suggested, you know, even in the book that, that Carol was mentioning earlier, the two regimes look like they could have a lot in common, you know, up to the degree that it might be actually quite difficult to distinguish between them in practice. Insofar as what, what distinguishes them seemingly in the kind of Rawlsian typology of regimes is just a difference in the formal distribution of, of underlying property rights. But if in both systems de facto control over productive resources were very broadly dispersed, tending towards a, a fully egalitarian distribution, then questions of de jure ownership might drop out to some degree or might, might seem like they're, less, like they're less relevant. But I think that, um, that one way of complicating the picture is that we have to foreground questions about the degree to which justice makes demands of economic democracy. We have to put that much more fully into the picture. So this is my first, my first kind of suggestion about why that simple Rawlsian typology needs a great deal more uh, complication. So in his discussion of, of Mill, um, Rawls makes it clear that, um, that, you know, there might well be a case in justice uh, for having a more uh, more sort of, you know, worker self-management, more workplace democracy, and, you know, people like Wahid Hussain and uh, Nin uh, Hei Shea and, uh, and myself and others have written about, you know, about that, that kind of case. Um, if you bring that dimension about um, economic democracy and just, the, you know, the organisation, the dispersal of, of uh, decision-making power at work into, uh, into the picture, then that gives you not, not just two options, but something like uh, a two by two grid, a structure beloved of philosophers uh, everywhere. So if you think about a contrast between economic hierarchy and economic democracy that cuts across um, a distinction between private ownership or some form of uh, collective or socialized ownership, that gives you four, four sorts of options. So, uh, so you could have egalitarian capitalism without economic democracy, um, so I think my, my York colleague Alan Thomas in his book, Property, uh, Predistribution and Property Owning Democracy, I think is defending something a bit like that. I, he may or may not accept that. He doesn't like it when I call him a, a capitalist. Um, you could have the sort of view that I think Samuel Freeman um, comes close to, which is advocating property owning democracy, but with the injection of uh, of more economic democracy. So, for example, in Freeman's discussion in um, in his his rules book from two thousand and, and, and six, um, or on the socialist side, you could think of something like Roma's scoop on socialism that actually, um, you know, the, the residual property rights are, are, are collective, or you know, they're held by the state. But that 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 could be operationalized in the system that's actually got a lot of economic hierarchy in, in, in the way that things are, are organized or for someone who I think you know has a um, you know a, a more a more sort of fully democratic version of a, of a socialist regime there's something like David Schweikart's book so 
Um, so, um, what David Schweikart's actually also has a, a, a chapter in the, the book on property owning democracy that, that Carol mentioned. So, one you know small mapping claim here is that there's plausibly much more difference between the rows here than between the columns. If you think about what the what those um, what those different kinds of economic regimes would be like, you know, to be in, um, I think it's very plausible that 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 distinction between more or less hierarchical ways of organizing economic production seems more important than the, the underlying distribution of the property rights within that, that economy. So socialism is, I think, you know, about, um, it's, you know, it, it's not just about the distribution of ownership. So uh, Carol mentioned um, the, the piece that I wrote with, with Pablo Gilbert. Um, for the, the Stanford Encyclopedia, trying to, you know, just do, again, do some mapping of the kind of the political philosophy of socialism. And, you know, we talk there about the goals of socialists in terms of um, issues relating to control and participation in the economy. And so it seems very forced and artificial and misleading to think that what makes an economic system socialist is purely a matter of its underlying ownership structure. So when looking at that, that grid, I don't think it's a straightforward matter to say whether most socialists would be more concerned with the distinction between the columns or the distinctions between the rows. So the debate on which kind of plausible options might exist for an economic system should not be a simple choice between property owning democracy um, or, uh, or liberal socialism, but it must encompass an absolute minimum, you know, thinking about those two cross-cutting distinctions. Now, I'm going to suggest that the situation is much more complicated than that, but that's sort of one initial claim I want to make about, you know, the, this other dimension that needs to be given the same sort of uh, salience. So, Rawls uh, gets his typology of kinds of economic regime from James Mead. And one thing that's happened to me <laughs> over the past few years is I've become increasingly geekily obsessed by by James Mead, who I think is is actually perhaps one of the, the most interesting economic thinkers of the you know the last sort of century or so, but you know perhaps whose whose work maybe hasn't had quite the attention it should have done. And I think something goes really wrong with Rawls's reading of Mead. Something goes a little bit awry. Um, and actually Mead's way of drawing out of thinking about the territory is much more useful and generative than Rawls's way of inheriting uh, that language from from Mead. So Mead defends what he calls liberal socialism. Now, on his way of thinking, that's a combination of um, some property-owning democracy-type institutions, some sort of state socialist-type institutions, and some welfare state institutions. And he thinks that that mix is important. Having them all in play at once is what makes for a liberal socialist regime. For rules, liberal socialism is instead the name he gives to the the kind of uh, the non-private ownership alternative to property owning democracy or to the capitalist welfare state. Now, obviously, real regimes always and everywhere are, are mixed economies, right? So, you know, so e even to think in, it's, it's not obvious that it's that useful to think in the abstract about, you know, a fully privately owned economy or a fully um, state, state owned or publicly owned. Uh, economy, given that you know everywhere and always there's some sort of there's some sort of mix, we might do much better, I think, to follow Mead's approach and to think about institutional mi mixes, to think about the particular combination of institutional structures that that fit together in one basic structure in Rawls's sense, rather than to think in the way that Rawls sets the problem up as as one of you know choosing between these very absolute kind of alternatives. But not only in terms of how we think about um, think about the, the different possibilities should we follow Mead, I want to make the stronger claim that we've got reason to follow Mead's argument for why we need this kind of institutional mix, why we need welfare state, private property, and uh, and sort of collective socialist uh, institutions uh, if we're to have a, a just society. And I think, you know, what what Mead's work kind of is quite useful for thinking through is ways in which there are particular advantages to particular kinds of mixed economy that couldn't be instantiated by either of the more kind of extreme uh, sorts of options. So here's James Mead 
uh, and he's standing here next to a machine that used to live in the uh, the British Treasury uh, in Whitehall, and that, believe it or not, it, uh, is a model of the uh, the British economy in, I suppose, the 1960s or thereabouts, uh, done with various fluids and levers and so on, where, you know, a change in the interest rate or the inflation rate or whatever would be modelled by, you know, the speed of some pump or the degree to which some valve was open or whatever. And they would run simulations of the British economy on this machine. So pre presumably they have other ways of doing it now, but um, but um, I think the machine was, was kept. So Mead says, um, when he's talking about um, talking about the kind of mixed routing that, that he endorses, he says, if private property were much more equally divided, this, by the way, this is from a paper he wrote in, um, I think, in 1946 or 47, where he's um, he's doing work for the research department of the, the British Labour Party. So this was before um, before he had the kind of academic successes as an economist that he was going to, to, go on to have. He said, we, we would achieve the mixed citizen, both worker and property owner at the same time, to live in the mixed economy of public and private enterprise. The ownership of private property could then fulfil its useful function of providing a basis for private enterprise and for individual security and independence without carrying with it the curse of social inequality as it does now. So, so that thought of, uh, of having that, that kind of institutional mix is something that he thinks, you know, allows, allows you know, private property and, you know, private ownership of private property to then sort of do its job as long as, you know, that's embedded within a, a, broader, a broader structure. So I want to sort of run with that idea a little bit. So the idea of the mixed citizen here would seem to be that as a citizen in a democratic society, we, I mean, this is my sort of, um, my stretching uh, of means idea. We have a kind of double identity which carries two sets of reasonable political aspirations. So on the one hand, we're individuals with our own projects and our own interests, and who need the economic means in order to pursue those interests and those, those projects. On the other hand, on the other hand, we recognise our standing as the equals of our fellow citizens, and we want to live in a society that both avoids excessive material inequalities and takes seriously our standing as one citizen standing as an equal among others. So this is basically, you know, this is a picture in terms of, you know, Rawls' idea of the, the two moral powers. So a combined, a, a sort of median economy that has a, a range of different kinds of institutional structures in it, some more collective, some more, uh, some more private property type, some more uh, just, just about public provision or redistribution in a, a welfare state type way. So Mead's economy, with its mix of private property, socialist and welfare state institutions, takes seriously this kind of multi-sidedness of our status as, as citizens with both public and private interests. So it creates a kind of institutional structure that mirrors the, kind of, the different kinds of aspirations that we might have and provides an environment in which they could be realised. And a structure that didn't have these different institutional types wouldn't have that kind of isomorphism. It wouldn't have that kind of mirroring of these, these different kinds of aspirations that run alongside each other. So I think the thing, the move that Rawls makes of saying, so, you know, Rawls says we, we can't choose philosophically between property and democracy and liberal socialism. He says, you know, that has to be, well, as he puts it, the choice depends in large part upon the traditions, institutions, and social forces forces of each country and its particular historical circumstances. And, and I think that that can't really stand because there are going to be real questions about the way in which different kinds of institutions allow citizens as free and equal with these different kinds of, with the two moral powers in Rawls' own terms, with these uh, different kinds of political aspirations to, to pursue them. And so we need to think, you know, I, I think if, if political philosophers sort of recuse ourselves from the, the job of trying to think in a, in a principled way about these sorts of uh, institutional structures. It's not that the work will get done in the same way elsewhere, right? I think these, these are things that we do have to try and uh, think through. The, and the answer can't depend, I think, on, you know, appealing to the traditions or institutions of particular, uh, particular countries, you know, particular places. But the question of justice is basically the question about what set of institutions we ought to have um, and how they ought to operate and appealing to uh, appealing to history or 
or you know political contingency or political sociology in that way seems to seems you know not to stand sufficiently far back in thinking about what what might be at stake here okay so um that's just a you know a, a very quick sketch of the contrast between Rawls's way of thinking about economic systems and Mead's way of thinking about um about sets of institutions and how they might fit together and a suggestion for how the kind of median framing might be better than the Rawlsian framing and just a very just a hint of an argument just the kind of the outline of an argument for why it is that given the the sort of given the different kinds of political aspirations that the citizens might have that there might be a case actually for um for, for that kind of you know mixed economy for that sort of if you like you know well you know social democratic mix or, or whatever it might be rather than for either a proprietary democracy or for a form of liberal socialism i want to talk a little bit now so this is um uh part three about what rules says about markets and about public goods because i think rules ends up i mean this is to give the ending away i think rules ends up as someone who had engaged so seriously and with such a sensitiveness to the existing economic discussions i think he ends up a little bit led astray by some ways that economists had framed these issues and i think you know the full potential of Rawls's normative theory, of Rawls's theory of justice, has been a little bit restricted there by a set of, of, of assumptions about public goods and about markets that have come from, from economists. So we'll see whether that's, that's going to be a plausible claim. So socialists have often advanced claims, obviously, about the limits of markets and the degree to which areas of social life should be moved out of market relationships through public provision and the decomposition decommodification of some important goods and that's another area I think in which Rawls's own discussion of economic systems just underestimates both the significance and the complexity of the issues at hand okay so here's here's what here's what uh, Rawls says about uh, about public provision and public goods so Rawls says to begin with it's helpful to distinguish between two aspects of the public sector Otherwise, the difference between a private property economy and socialism is left unclear. So, the first aspect is to do with the ownership of the means of production. Now, as I was saying in the first part of this talk, I think he you know, places a bit too much emphasis on that, that idea. The classical distinction, says so rules, is that the size of the public sector under socialism, as measured by the fraction of total output produced by state-owned firms and managed either by state officials or by workers' councils, is much larger. In a private property economy, the number of publicly owned firms is presumably small and in any event limited to special places such as public utilities and transportation. So that was one distinction. The other one then, he says, um, um, the, the second aspect, the second thing that he wants to emphasize is um, the second picture of the public sector is that the proportion of total social resources uh, devoted to public goods. The distinction between public and private goods raises a number of intricate points, but the main idea is that a public good has two characteristic features, indivisibility and publicness. So that's, you know, obviously a statement of the orthodox, um, uh, the orthodox understanding of what a public good is from, from economics. Okay. So rules then in, in that discussion goes on from talking about public goods um, and uh, talks about uh, externalities and then, then says this. He says the final point about public goods. Since the proportion of social resources devoted to their production is distinct from the question of public ownership of the means of production, there's no necessary connection between the two. Right. So the, you know, we've got another cross-cutting distinction here. A private property economy may allocate a large fraction of national income for these purposes, or a socialist society a small one, and vice versa. Okay, so what I want to say here is that Rawls's framework in giving us these two axes about thinking about the size of the, of the public or the private sectors and the amount of social product devoted to public goods ends up getting a bit mystifying and losing what we really might be interested in here when we're thinking about which areas are going to be given over to public provision and pulled out of markets, right? The, the, the rules in framework doesn't, it sort of, it occludes some of the, the more interesting normative questions that I'm going to uh, suggest. 
And in part, it's because his account of public goods is directly inherited from, uh, from, from economics, right? So it, it, it's quite a technical idea of, of public goods. So this brings me to the second of my two by two grids uh, to which I've become strangely addicted. So we've got Rawls's two axes here in thinking about um, thinking about public provision of the public sector. So you could have, so think about our two rows, you could have a high or a low level of provision of public goods in the technical sense, right? So the, the you know, things like national defense or, um, or, you know, regulation of air quality, you know, the, these sorts of um, non-excludable public, uh, public goods. And thinking of our two columns, you could have an economy where most production was by publicly owned firms or by privately owned, well, most production was from the public sector or from the private, private sector. Now, if you, if you think either of these distinctions really picks out, you know, what, what we might be interested in if we think about, um, think about, um, you know, the choice between property owning democracy and liberal socialism, or, or just the choice between capitalism and socialism in general, I think you go, you end up going astray. So again, starting on the top left, imagine, imagine a society I'll call militaria, right? So militaria, um, publicly owned economy, um, huge, huge amounts of uh, public expenditure just go into, uh, into military expenditure, right? That's the main thing that goes on in that, that economy. Now, as you know, as has come out during the COVID pandemic, there's a sort of very odd form of thinking that says, well, it's socialism if the state does it. Well, clearly, you know, if, if the state was, was uh, just doing this, was just kind of, you know, concentrating on directing economic products uh, uh, to, uh, towards military, um, towards military uh, provision, defense provision, that doesn't really look like a, like a socialist society in any interesting way. Well, then let's think about uh, Marchetia. Um, so Marchetia could be a Romerian economy. So John Roma, um, you know, advocates this, this form of uh, coupon socialism. So you bet you have, um, you know, you have something that could look on the surface very like, uh, very like a, you know, private, uh, private free market economy, but the residual property rights are kind of uh, reside with, with, uh, with the state rather than with individuals. Now, you know, it might be that there's very little public provision there, right? You could imagine, uh, you know, that that's a, a Romarian society that didn't didn't do much collectively at all, right? It was just, you know, maybe, maybe a very cutthroat, um, a very sort of privatized looking economy, but just with a different distribution of residual property rights. And again, that 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 would seem, you know, not to capture what we might be interested in if we're thinking about, you know, should we. Should we should we endorse basically a form of egalitarian capitalism or a form of, of egalitarian liberal socialism? So moving to the other the other column, I think there the the distinction between the two rows puts some pressure on um, on you know the, the idea of public goods that, that that's in play. Um, now clearly, Rawls is right. There's a difference between public financing of provision and direct public provision, right? So you could imagine, so top right here, cooperativa, I, I'm imagining, which would be, imagine a society where um, every firm was a Mondragon style cooperative, right? This, is, this doesn't have public ownership of the economy. This is, you know, the, the, the economy might be one that sort of, um, you know, that's predominantly owned by, uh, by, you, you know, not not by state institutions, but by uh, but by the members of, of cooperatives, and you could have you know just a small active state that you know that that directs um, you know some of these uh, these cooperatives to engage in various forms of, of public provision, or Fredonia here with a with a nod to the the Marx Brothers uh, in the the bottom right. So you know, which looks like given given the distinctions that we're all set up, that looks like it should be the kind of regime that's furthest from uh, from a socialist type regime. But you could imagine um, you could imagine a society where um, actually the need for public good provision is relatively limited, but never the, the public goods in the the sort of the narrow technical sense, things like defence or. Uh, or you know the provision of, of good air quality or whatever, but nevertheless, where you have imagine a society that had a network of uh, Mondragon 
Pipe Cooperative, directed by a small activist state, and, and a huge amount of what they did was the provision of uh, collective benefits, the, collect the, the provision of, um, of goods that, that can be, you know, sort of used by, by people very broadly, albeit things that aren't public goods in the kind of technical sense. So Fredonia, as I say, it could be rather like cooperativa. There could be very little state ownership of economic institutions within an economic system that was nevertheless radically democratic and egalitarian. There's lots of workplace democracy. There's lots of uh, there's lots of like internal uh, democracy within within economic enterprises. And this could be a society that devoted a large pro pro proportion of available social resources to collective projects rather than to individual consumption. You might even want to say that that looks like an example of a kind of socialist, you know, one kind of socialist regime. And that could be so even if there was not much expenditure on public goods in the in the in the technical sense. So. So I think all of, you know, Rawls's sort of architecture here, thinking about these issues kind of directs us away from what some of the some of the, the more interesting issues are. So I've, I've talked about this idea of rules kind of inheriting the economist's idea of public goods. So, you know, the thing that Rawls is talking about when he talks about public good provision is the, is the provision of non-excludable goods, right? Um, it's, you know, it's the provision of things like national defense. Now that excludes many forms of public provision that we might, might want to argue for on grounds of social justice higher education right? or, or, you know, library system or, you know, if you wanted to provide free, free broadband or, or whatever it might be. We need to think about those kinds of potential public institutions in turn, I think. We need to think about what the case in justice is for demarketizing, decommodifying and, you know, and, and turning into kind of public, public institutions, particular kinds of functions within within our social and economic lives. We need to think about them seriously as regards what the role of those institutions mm -hmm. are. And we can't, I think, fall back on the formal point about whether they count as public goods in the technical sense. So if you think about Bernie Sanders or you think about the Labour Party between 2015 and 2019 in the UK, democratic socialist platforms have often argued for decommodification and public provision uh, outside the market of quite a range of goods and services from healthcare and social care to post compulsory education and training, public housing, childcare, broadband, and an approach that's grounded in the Rawlsian understanding of social justice absolutely has the resources, absolutely has the resources to assess those kinds of democratic socialist claims as soon as the underlying theory gets free from some of these artificial limitations that it places on itself that it's had by building in this orthodox approach to public goods and this vision of the state as having a kind of residual role in a, in a market economy. So I want to talk just very briefly about libraries, because I think libraries are a great example of what I'm getting at here. So in a strict technical sense, a library is not a public good, right, in the, in the strict economist sense. Unlike national defence, a library system can be enjoyed to different degrees by different citizens, and also, unlike national defence, its use is subject to a certain amount of mutual excludability. You and I obviously can't borrow the same books at the same time. Nor are there other, there are no insuperable technical obstacles to creating a market in books. There is a market in books, right? And indeed, those markets exist alongside public library systems, you know, nearly everywhere. So on an expanded, non-technical reading of the term, Libraries are a quintessential example of a public good. A society that, that builds and maintains a library system has taken a decision to express its values in a particular way and to create a non-market institution that embodies a commitment to those values. And it's that kind of thinking, I think, that we need to apply to different sets of institutions rather than starting from this schematic account of the, um, you know, the, of what the proper, um, the proper borders should be between um, uh, market provision and public provision. So I've, I'll, I'll give a link at the end of this, uh, at the end of this talk, to the, the the full version of this. And as Carol says, that the special issue will be out will be out soon. But I, I talk a little bit, um, and, the, and the special issue, even if you don't like my paper, will have Carol's paper in it. So there'll be a reason to, to read it anyway. Um, but I talk a little bit in that about, the, the, you know, one of my favourite films, The Wings of Desire, right, which, you know, um, 
you know, the so sex, you know, in in Berlin, you know, at the time of the, you know, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall. And, you know, as the people who've seen this film, you know, there's this scene where the, the angels are sort of, uh, who, you know, can't be seen, but are like inhabiting, inhabiting uh, the space where, where the normal kind of citizens are going about their lives. Where do they go? They go to the library. And here's what Vim Penders said about that. He said, when we were looking for a place in the city where the angels would live, would be at home, we looked for some time. Since angels are not really linked between people and God anymore, we could not do a church, so we tried for another place. I thought, this is a heavenly place, a library. <laughs> so, so the thought is, there's certain sorts of values that a society is, is trying, to, uh, trying to take seriously, trying to realise when it, when it decommodifies um, you know, the access to books right, and builds something like a beautiful library. So Daniel and Cassiel, the, the angels in, in, uh, in Wings of Desire, they're in the Staatsbibliothek in Berlin. They're not in a shoe shop or a gas station or somewhere like that, because that's a play, it's a public space outside the bounds of commodification and mere consumer preferences. It's an institution that's aiming at something a bit higher. So I've got, I've got a link there to the, if anyone wants to, there's a clip from the movie, if anyone wants to look at this after it. Um, now this in the background is the new library in Oslo, which is a gorgeous sort of public cathedral. This amazing, amazing, amazing space. So here's, here's my, you know, minimalist claim about libraries. I, I take a bet, right, that whatever your account of a just society, it's going to have libraries in it. A just society is going to have flourishing, well-funded libraries. Um, now, I'm not, not, I won't make that argument in detail here, but here's like any number of ways that could go on, on sort of, you know, from a Rawlsian starting point. Um, you could think that, that, you know, things like libraries created conditions for the protection and development of citizens through moral powers. And so you could think that that's exactly the kind of public institution that you need to kind of protect the, uh, the, um, the exercise of those and therefore it, it connects to the basic liberties. You might talk about the, the role of access to learning and information as a precondition for fair value of the political liberties or for fair equality of opportunity. You might think that these sorts of public institutions provide one aspect of the social basis of self-respect. Or, you know, there might be a, a lot of different kinds of arguments that you could make that take you from something like a Rawlsian account of uh, social justice to the justification of the public provision of this particular kind of good, but not because it's a public good in the, in the economist technical sense. So my point is that the question of whether we ought to sustain a library system as a public good is an important question of social justice and one that's absolutely not settled by answering the question whether libraries are public goods in that narrow sense. The question of whether they're public goods in the broader sense, that's a, you know, that's a deep, big normative question. It's not a technical uh, question for the economists. So I am going to finish in the next five minutes. Um, I know I started a little bit um, up time, but I, I do want to get into discussion. So uh, I'll just very quickly talk about this fourth idea, which is that rules takes planning. So another misstep that means that rules of theory ends up underperforming in terms of what it can do is the way that he takes issues around planning off the table too quickly. So I think one would be attacking a straw man if one thought that democratic socialism would have to involve the kind of detailed central economic plan associated with a pure command economy. Um, and the, at the same time, you should bear in mind that any society will involve a significant degree of state direction of the economy, at least in its general features. When you think about where you build infrastructure, when you think about um, when you think about you know just the location of, of, of public spending, when you you know when you think about are you going to are you going to have build airports or build rail or whatever, right? There are all, all of these kind of infrastructural decisions that are going to be made, you know, in, in you know, and uh, that are going to be you know, the, where it's inconceivable, I guess, that they're just, you know, purely left to the market, um, are going to involve, you know, in some degree issues of planning. So there's a huge open space of possibility that exists in between, on the one hand, forms of economic planning that would violate principles of justice. So, you know, a pure, you know, a command economy with a detailed production plan with no freedom of, of occupational choice that just assigned everyone to a work group or something. Which always, that always seems to be the model that's in, in view, you know, when 
Quinn Rawls or, or certain other people talk about economic planning. But there's a lot of sp this huge, this vast space between that and then thinking about, you know, the varieties and kinds of planning that, that you might have, including, you know, some of the kinds that you're going to have in any even, you know, conceivable society. Is going to, the, there are going to be some decisions that, that amount, you know, to some degree um, in economic planning. So um, I think, you know, the, the way in which when Rawls talks about economic regimes, he very quickly takes, um, takes kind of, you know, a Soviet command economy off the table, you know, quite properly one might think, but then, you know, takes that as, takes that as kind of involving a conclusion about the impermissibility of planning. That, that's much too quick because the category of economic planning could be very broad and capacious. And we need to think about what kinds of economic planning are permissible and what kinds aren't. And we can't just think about, uh, we can't just sort of think only of these very extreme, uh, extreme positions. So Hajun Chang and his work talks about, you know, the, the way there's already a lot, a lot of, you know, planning within capitalist economies, firms plan, right? There's, or, you know, if you think about some recent work, Tony Atkinson in his book on inequality talked about, you know, the role for democratic states in thinking about the direction of technological change or Mariana Masakato's work on, you know, the role of the state in kind of mission driven um, investment in, in innovation or so on. Or, of course, if you think of the climate emergency, it's just so obvious that we don't have the luxury of not planning. You know, we need comprehensive state action in order to kind of redirect the, you know, democratically redirect the course of the economy. And to get rid of that way of thinking, because you because you, you're taking the Soviet Union off the table, it's just, um, it's much, it's much, much too quick. As with everything, I, or so I claim, James Mead was there first. So I was reading Mead's wartime diaries. He's working for the, the Attlee government in, in economic policy. And he's got this little discussion paper where he talks about uh, the different main meanings that may be given to the idea of socialist economic planning. And he says, well, look, of course we're in favor of socialist planning. That's exactly what we need to do now after, you know, thinking about how to rebuild Britain after the war. But he says, we're not in favor of a GOSS plan. We're not in favor of, you know, the, the kind of plan that the, the Soviet economic planning ministry might have with a kind of detailed, you know, detailed sort of plan. So what he says is the liberal socialist solution um, involves a kind of planning that has a mixture of selective nationalizations, right? So decisions about kind of which, which, uh, which sorts of, economic activities get pulled out of markets, together with strategic use of regulation, taxation, directed subsidies and public spending, along with background control of interest and exchange rates. So Mead, you know, who um, is, I suppose, the single person most influential in rules way of thinking about economic regimes, Mead is there in the 40s making a, a distinction between the kind of liberal socialist planning that you could have in a democratic society as against, you know, kind of impermissible forms of planning that would crowd out uh, individual rights and liberties. So my conclusion, my approach has had, you know, I've just been thinking about how you might think more broadly about economic institutions from a Rawlsian starting point. But I hope that this will be of interest even to those who don't start from the same place as me. Because I think, you know, that the central normative foundations from rules are really minimalist, really, and quite widely shared. The idea is just that the task of social justice is to create a set of shared institutions for a democratic society conceived as a system of cooperation over time between free and equal people. So that animating normative ideal obviously has a lot in common with strands within democratic socialist thought that emphasize human emancipation from oppression, domination, and exploitation, which look to overcome inequalities of faith, of rank and power, and which value collective democratic self-determination and social solidarity. So I think, I hope that democratic socialists and Rawlsian and liberal egalitarians have more in common than they imagine as regards both their underlying normative orientations. And as I've been trying to, trying to lay out here, also with regards to many of the institutional conclusions to which those normative commitments should lead, even if they haven't always actually led there uh, within, within, uh, within kind of Rawlsian uh, liberalism. So what we have to do to make progress, I think, is 
sweep away some of the misleading assumptions about the economy, about public goods, about planning, about the nature of the choices that we have when we think about economic possibilities that have been built into routine discussions of economic uh, systems and institutions, and instead, like, turn to the underlying theory and then try and apply it in, in a way that, that sort of free from some of the misleading preconceptions that, that are built in from other, other parts of the overall uh, theoretical edifice. So, thank you very much for listening. Sorry for going a little bit longer than I intended to do. If anyone would like to, to read the full paper, um, as Carol uh, was indicating, uh, it seems like our special issue is, is, is in what in Hollywood they were called development hell, um, apart from the fact that it's, you know, everything's finished and, and, and it's, I think we're being held up by some other issue, but it will be out at some time. Uh, but if anyone wants to read a preprint, uh, there's a link that will take you to it and I'll look forward to discussing this with all of you um, now. So I will stop sharing my screen, I think. Okay, great. Oh, what am I managing to do that? Um, you have to click on the button somewhere. Oh. Yay! Okay, thank you very much. Well done, very interesting. <clears throat> I noticed nobody left during the whole thing. <laughs> We have the same number we started with, so uh, that's impressive, actually. Um, that's a miracle, a miracle. Yeah, no, it was very interesting. Um, so I would like to invite people to, I have some questions too, but I'll wait, and invite people to ask some questions by using the raise hand function, if possible. Um, surely you can't just all agree right away with this. <laughs> Well, uh, okay, we do have a few. Um, let me see who it is here. Okay, we'll start with Blaine Neufeld. Please, uh, we'll all be kind of brief, we'll try to be brief with our questions so we can go through a lot of different um, people. Now, where is, where's our speaker? Is he showing up here? I see ah, there you are. Great. Okay. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. So I re really like this paper, Martin, and um, thanks very much for it. I just have uh, maybe a question of clarification. So one of Rawls's main um, criticisms of capitalism is that it can't be stable over time because um, there's going to be an inevitable conflict. Um, and uh, this is sort of cashed out. Um, in Bill Edmondson's book is, uh, you know, a conflict between uh, those who uh, own capital and those who don't. And um, so Rawls' solution to this stability problem is to eliminate this division, right? So either in property owning democracy, everyone owns capital um, or in liberal socialism, there's no capitalist class. So um, I like your more nuanced approach, you know, this, sort of this mixed view, but I'm just wondering about um, the role of this concern with stability in it and uh, how your uh, more um, complicated uh, strategy uh, deals with the, sort of this kind of core uh, Rawlsian uh, claim. Thanks. Thank, thanks very much, Blaine. And nice to, nice to see you all, almost in real life or, or you know sort of bit more than just typing at, at, at one another um so I, I so I, I think um I think those those stability concerns really do do kind of bolster the, the kind of view I'm I'm suggesting right so it's so the greater kind of the greater kind of institutional complexity that the thought that that you know as a, as a citizen in this kind of mixed economy you're both you're a participant in welfare state type institutions you're you know you're a, a private a private property owner and you know and you're a, a participant in some collective type institutions as well now i didn't really go into what they might look like but you might think of you know things like um me talked about democratic uh, sovereign wealth funds right so you might have kind of collective sovereign wealth funds that had democratic governance or another idea might be something like rudolf meidner's idea of having um, having wage earner funds with democratic governance within uh, within firms. So basically, what what you're imagining here is is a kind of um, a more complicated kind of economic settlement with more dispersal of the points of like control and contestation and and so on. So so it ought to be um, 
you know, I think sort of more, more stable than either, either a, a, a you know, purely statist or a, or a purely free market alternative. Um, I mean, I, I, I feel in one way a bit, a bit guilty to, you know, talk about this issue and not talk much about, or not talk at all in the paper about Bill, Bill Edmondson's book. But I worry that what he does is that he makes some heroic assumptions about how stable a, um, how stable a, um, a, a, a kind of state, you know, state socialist economy might be, such that, you know, it, it sometimes seems to me like he's comparing the ideal version of his socialist system with the kind of really existing unstable version of, of capitalism. And I think, you know, what we need to do is be very, you know, is be serious about the, the kinds of sources of instability that might exist in both, in both kinds of institutions. And given that, I think the median, uh, if you'll pardon the pun, the median sort of institutional mix, this sort of democratic socialist or social or social democratic, whatever you want to call it, mix, is one way of, you know, thinking about what an overall more stable system might look like, where there are these kind of counter, countermanding points where, where these sources of instability are, are kind of um, are damped down by the fact that um, the power, as it were, isn't all within one kind of institution or, or, or one kind or, or in, in one location. So, uh, really helpful question. Thanks very much. Uh, Michael, Michael Cates. Hi, uh, I really enjoyed your talk, uh, Professor O'Neill. So, my question sort of uh, is about your starting point in this discussion. So, you mentioned that Raul says that. Um, the choice is between either a property owning democracy or liberal socialism. And you, I think, rightfully said that that uh, assumes falsely that we can have a mixed economy. But in talking about the mixed economy, you completely ignored, at least in this talk, and I haven't read your paper, so correct me if I'm wrong, you ignored the role that a welfare state can play. And it seems to me that even in a liberal socialist regime or a property owning democracy, you will need a welfare state because half the population are not workers. So children, uh, people who are disabled, caretakers, the elderly students, they can't receive an income from paid productive work. And so the welfare state is needed precisely in order to decommodify some aspects of the economy. So to ensure that people receive an income irrespective of their uh, ability to work and that seems to be a requirement for any economy because these periods of non-work are a basic feature of, peop of people's lives. Like everyone's gonna be a child, everyone's gonna be elderly at some point, we're all gonna get sick, we're all probably gonna get disabled in some ways. And so you need a welfare state to take care of that. And I think Rawls is, you know, you know, jettisoning of the welfare state in favor of these alternative regimes ignores this basic function um, that any uh, just economy has to take into account. Great, great question. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, so, I, I, so I'm going to come to Rawls's defense and then try and come to my own. So I think it's certainly true that Rawls sets up, you know, the, this sort of set piece um, this sort of set piece uh, choice between welfare state capitalism, property owning democracy, and liberal socialism. But of course, even though he wants to reject, you know, the, the sort of generalization of, of, of the welfare state as the kind of, you know, the, 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 the kind of compensatory welfare state as, as the central, um, you know, the central way of organizing um, the economic system, of course. You know, he does. He does then want to say, well, you, you know, he, he's imagining that there would be um, a healthcare system. He's imagining that there would be, um, you know, forms of, of um, you know, public provision for for those those outside the the labour market. So I, I I think I think Rawls actually ends up with with you know the, the, there's the bit where he kind of sets things up very starkly, but I, I think ultimately he you know he does want to allow you know quite a quite a broad role for you know the for example this book you know he, he ends up basically endorsing norman daniels's position on on healthcare systems and so on you know quite quite appropriately um so yeah i, I didn't talk about the welfare state so much in in um uh in in this paper but certainly there's the thought that um that it's precisely that kind of mix of the, you know that that's among the mix of different kinds of institutions that that you would that you would want to have there. 
um, that you might want sort of forms of, um, you know, forms of like collective democratic institutions like, you know, whether it's Meidnerian um, uh, wage earner institutions or, or Mead type um, collective capital institutions. But then you would also want, you know, in, it's, uh, the same provision of, 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 you know, a range of, of familiar kinds of welfare state institutions. I suppose one, one issue that really comes up, though, is, you know, what the limits of the welfare state might be and what sorts of things, you, you know, ought to be included within it, right? So, um, so Michael, in, you know, in, in, in your cases, you're thinking about people who are outside the labour market um, and, you know, people who, who, you know, maybe have to, um, have to sort of seek, seek support from public institutions. But I think, you know, there might be lots of cases where we want to provide something, you know, like, you know, like the library case, right, as a kind of, as a, as a public good, as a state provided uh, institution, precisely because that serves the interests of, 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 of having a just society to, to do that. Now, whether you want to call that, you know, an expansive account of the welfare state, um, or whether you think of that as, as something separate, that if you think of the welfare state only as, you know, for, for those who, who are sort of outside the labour market. Um, you know, I, don't, I mean, I, I'm more drawn to that first way of thinking, but in, in fact, you know, this, this way of arguing could, could lead you more towards, a, you know, a, a kind of expansive account of, of what, what the limits of the welfare state ought to be and might, you know, might capture more, more kinds of institutions, more kinds of benefits than than we, you know, traditionally associate with that. You know, whether that's, you know, whether that's, um, you know, things like, you know, it, it would would decommodified universal free broadband be part of a welfare state, or you know, or you know, one could think about it that way, I guess. Um, uh, so great, uh, John Pittman, did you want to? Uh, you have a question in the chat. Did you want to present it? Where else? John, you there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to jump in anyway while uh, people um, I'm eager to engage this. So, Martin, I um, end up uh, in the same place uh, for the shorter term anyway, as you do, arguing, you know, from rethinking democracy on for uh, worker self management the centrality of worker self-management, self-managing organizations within a market context, um, you know, taking Mondragon and other such uh, instances as a model and um, as does to some degree David Schweikert, but he has a stronger emphasis on public ownership uh, of all the means of production. Um, in the shorter term, I guess I would say I would be arguing for something like between Cooperativa and Fredon Fredonia, but I have a question about that, but um, in which I want to get to, but I guess I really disagree that you can get this stuff out of Rawls, and I think Rawls debates have become rather stale. Um, <laughs> we certainly don't encourage them in our journal, by the way, but uh, it has to be really original, but you know, I think he made some fundamental errors at the beginning that uh, you're, I'm glad you're moving a little bit away from his perspective, but he made some fundamental errors despite the overall validity of an <clears throat> emphasis on free and equal um, in a cooperative uh, society. Uh, but, you know, I don't want to harp on it, but I'll just list some. I mean, the separation between the two principles is fundamentally problematic and cannot really account for the centrality of economic human rights in addition to civil and political ones. His, his con idea of democracy and taking it in this very traditional sense that it's limited to uh, some kind of uh, structure, um, you know, political uh, structure of majority rule in voting doesn't open it up to an, an account of agency and economic democracy. Um, he doesn't give an adequate account of social reproduction. And um, he also doesn't take seriously the Marxist idea that one needs to look at the organization of production, with, given the heavy um, emphasis on distribution and distributive justice. So those are among the problems. I think uh, an account of equal positive freedom does much better. And that's what I've argued for. So that's just a two cents thing. I don't know that we need to get into it. Um, 
but to get the results that you want, I don't really think it needs to be limited anyway to a, uh, a Rawlsian effort. Um, I guess the question I would have, though, more interestingly, is um, on I. I'm also very interested in this um, self-managing firms within a market context as sort of core, applied also to the domain of social reproduction, and uh, the idea that not all that they, you can make a distinction between public uh, financing and public provision of collective goods. But I'm wondering how you have in mind uh, that to get firms to produce the collective goods that we need what would be the actual organization or implementation? How would you incentivize these collective, co cooperatively organized firms to produce the collective goods and public goods that we need? How do you see that element addressed within the proposals that you're sort of sympathetic to? Great. Um, so, I, I mean, I can't resist saying something on the first part of your question. Yeah, I know. I, I want to promote you that way too, but in but, uh, but, order. I, but I mean, I, but in, in a way, I, I guess, um, not because I want to get into, you know, what a, I guess, you know, sometimes, Rosiana. Rosiana. you know, kind of, yeah, and, and, you know, sort of what can be quite, quite familiar debates, but, but just in terms of the, um, you know the what I'm what I'm up to really, or what, what, I'm, what I'm trying trying to do here. I, I I think you know for those who've you know for those who've got sort of um, you know fundamental kind of conceptual normative disagreements with with the Rawlsian kind of approach. Um, you know that's well. You know there, there are arguments to be had, and there are there are things that that um, that, that might be said there. But what what I'm really interested in, I suppose, is just trying to kind of close close this gap that I think has really, um, really sort of opened up from the um, well, but you know, perhaps from both sides when when one sort of moves from thinking about some of the the kind of foundational normative issues to thinking about well, you know, where where should our kind where should our our sort of mid range theorizing be directed in terms of you know, thinking about apply question. You know, thinking about the organisation of the economy. Thinking about you know what are the main questions in you know normative political economy, uh, as one might think of it, that that ought to be receiving attention from you know from political philosophers, political theorists, and and so on. And and here I think you know some of the things that that have maybe got you know a bit more attention within certain socialist strands of thinking are exactly some of the same things actually that um that liberal egalitarianism should be directing its attention a, a, a bit more towards and you know on on its own on its own normative foundations there are there are reasons uh, to do that so i so i think that's i think that that's a kind of worthwhile project hopefully to sort of um you know to, to show that there might be um you know there might be quite a sort of i mean pablo Gilbert, uh, and I and our, our Stanford piece talk about, you know, sort of liberal arguments for socialism as, you know, quite quite a sort of interesting category, you know, where where kind of one might end up with conclusions that are quite close to uh, quite close to um, um, institutional um, um, institutional um, uh, um, proposals for you know within the, within the democratic socialist tradition where you might end up there on on the basis of, of you know a kind of liberal egalitarian starting point so i think so i think that's worth doing both to kind of um you know my my you know absolute hope is that i could manage to redirect you know some attention of some some sort of fellow liberal egalitarians towards some of these these issues around planning or around yeah. uh around you know sort of non um, sort of increase in, increase public provision in, in some of these areas or, or whatever it might be. Can um, I jump in before you get to part yeah. two? Uh, yeah. well, I just wanted to add, I neglected to add another problem with, with Rawls in my view was that there isn't enough focus on exploitation and, on, and also on hierarchy. It comes in more peripherally than it ought to, um, to generate the importance of democratic management within economic life. 
to my mind. But okay, I just wanted to add my whole list of problems to it. But no, I, I your effort yeah. to, you know, everybody should be addressing these things from their perspective. Yeah. So, so. I, and I hope on the other side that um, that you know, there, there, there's just a, a lot of a lot of sort of you know, quite quite sort of counterproductive maybe sort of thinking on on the left that just wants to yeah. kind of say look there's nothing valuable in this tradition or this way of thinking oh, that's terrible i didn't mean to endorse that no 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 you're yeah i mean you're you're not doing that but you know one does one does see that one does yes. see that so so i think you know in terms of the sort of meta the kind of meta philosophy of the, the, the sort of uh, debate. I, I, I would, you know, I, I, I think, um, you know, it's hopefully, it's hopefully a kind of useful project, even for those whose starting point is, you know, more, um, you, you know, in some, in some sense, you know, has has elements that that don't fit within that kind of liberal egalitarian uh, paradigm. Uh, so, on 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 your your second question, I I, I suppose what I'm I mean, the, the kind of case I was imagining was, um, you know, if, if you did have, if you had sort of, um, let's say some sort of, you know, at, at, at the moment, um, you know, we're, we're quite familiar in lots of, lots of uh, jurisdictions with different kinds of public-private partnerships or whatever, right, where the state, um, you know, the, the state engages with some, you um, um, you know, hierarchical uh, capitalist firm in order to, you know, deliver some uh, some benefit. And, you know, th there might be a thought that sometimes you want direct public provision and other times, you know, it might make sense. There might be, you know, there might be good normative reasons that you want to have, um, you want to have the state, you know, provide provide some uh, some good by, by contracting it out. Now, often, you know, how that, how that works in, in reality, it's often, you know, it's, it's often mm. highly exploitative. It's often, um, you know, it's often the case that um, that you end up with uh, basically just kind of extractive models where uh, where particular kind of private firms kind of just, just uh, derive, you know, quite quite disproportionate benefits from those sorts of arrangements. But I suppose what I was thinking of with regard to, um, you know, some of those those models where you might have, you know, quite a small, uh, a relatively small state, but lots of lots of kind of collective uh, provision. It's where you might have more um, more sort of like public cooperative partnerships, right? Where there was more, um, you know, more. Well, I mean, you know, again, I suppose if you think about your your sort of the a kind of Mondragon style economy, uh, but also, but where. Um, I mean, there might be different things that your Mondragon type firms are doing. They might just be engaged in in market competition with other firms and trying to, you know, trying to do well. In, um, I mean, I, I got to visit a couple of years ago. Went to the, you know, the the elevator factory where they make Arona elevators. So, you know, if you're ever in a, so it's, and ever since then, I've always looked at who the manufacturer is when I'm in an elevator to see if it's the kind of the cooperative made, you know, the sort of workers elevator or not. But you know, so you might just be doing that. I take it you might just be, you know, sort of making some some product that's going to be out in the market and competing with others. But, I mean, I think you could certainly imagine cases where um, a democratic state wants to, you know, contract with a with a cooperative firm to provide some, you know, some good. So, I mean, if, if it turns out that, um, you know, th so think of, I mean, going back to Michael's question, think of like, you know, really good, well, kind of expansive welfare state type uh, type institution. Think of something like Danish childcare provision, where there's you know fantastic childcare um, for, for preschool kids. Um, you know, you can imagine one model where that's that state that's direct state provision. You can imagine another model where there'll be uh, you know some public funding for local childcare cooperatives to do that. And I think you know being being kind of institutional pluralist there is a is a good thing to be because you know there might well be. You know, kind of interesting practical uh, possibilities there that we that we don't want to rule out by just bringing in an overly schematic model of what the what the possibilities are. So that, that that's just a bit of a, um, a, a, a sketch of an answer to your just a kind of question.
Okay. Uh, Patricia, did you want to read John Pittman's question? Because he doesn't have a mic. I thought it would be useful to. Yeah, sure. I can do that. Um, uh, he says, John Pittman, they say, I wonder if there's an issue of economies of scale here, which along with market dynamics tends to the creation of larger and larger enterprises. Monopolization, exclamation mark. Um, I can't wait. I, this is just- How to address, okay, it says, how to address this problem in a mixed model, even assuming truly democratic political control. Well, that's a big <laughs> that is a big question. I mean, so I, I guess one thing that um, I guess there's there's always there's always this tension, isn't there, between like the the cooperative benefits from economies of scale versus the the sort of the the kind of economic and social risks of the kind of concentrations of power that you get with with economies of scale. Um, and so you know, I, I suppose. Um, you know, there's, there's one kind of argument for increased state provision. You know, if you think of like the arguments for an, a, an NHS type healthcare system, as opposed to, you know, a, a, a sort of disaggregated um, system of, of healthcare provision, you know, that that's exactly, I take it, a kind of economies of scale type, type argument there. That, um, and whether, you know, whether one then, you know, sort of is, is normatively worried about, about the potential downside of, of, of those sorts of, um, uh, of those sorts of uh, um, kind of large, large agglomerations is, is something that might differ from, from case to case. So I think, so, I mean, again, this is going to be a little bit like my answer to Blaine's question, I think, but that the idea of having having um, a sort of economic structure that has different kinds of institutional types, that has more points of sort of power and, 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 and control and, and sort of decision making and different kinds of different kinds of institutions might allow you to overcome some of those worries about monopolization or might allow you to overcome some of those worries about the, the downsides of, of economies of scale. Whereas at the same time, you know, thinking thinking kind of selectively about where there is a case for expanded state provision rather than leaving things to market, even if these aren't cases of, um, you know, a, a public provision in the technical sense. Um, you know, there it might, you know, precisely be the case that, you know, worries about, um, sorry, no, no, there it might precisely be the case that the benefit, the return, the cooperate, the, the, the returns, the, uh, the, the the kind of cooperative benefits of uh, of returns to scale there might might be exactly part of the part of the reason why you think that that you ought to go in that direction. Um, so I I think that that you know the median sort of mixed mixed economy alternative manages to um, you know manages to overcome a lot of these uh, these sorts of problems that are more pronounced either in either in a, you know, kind of pure, uh, uh, you know, maybe sort of Edmondson's more kind of purely, um, purely sort of, um, uh, sort of state socialist type um, system or in a, uh, or in a, 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 a private property free market. Great, we have another question from Patricia. Great, thank you so much, um, Martin. That was really interesting and I, applaud your effort to try to like uh, reconcile, I think was the word that you used um, and find some sort of common ground between these two positions, which I think I, I'm sympathetic to the project. Um, to put my cards on the table, I'm not sympathetic to using Rawls as my starting point and like the ideal theorizing that he does, but I take your point in response to Carol. Um, and I think we can have different starting points and still land on um, mutually satisfactory, um, you know, solutions as we're trying to like figure out what to do. But my, my question, I guess, um, is about something you said at the end of your response to Carol's question about um, having to be a little, having to be open-ended um, to the solutions 
to the various sort of arrangements that we um, implement in different societies. I think you mentioned um, like the child welfare, um, the child care system in Denmark. Um, and it seemed that in, in that answer, you were alluding to, um, yeah, the, the virtue of an open-endedness to the various forms, um, the various yeah, economic mechanisms that we decide to implement in a certain society. But I guess that stands in tension with a claim that you made earlier um, against Rawls's um, agnosticism um, and this idea that you don't actually need to be very historically, culturally, societally specific, but we can actually make some claims about the institutions that we think um, should be implemented from these more general principles. Um, I guess we can disagree with that latter point on a like ideal versus non-ideal for theory sort of point, but I just wanted to like tease out this tension between an open-endedness and this ideal theory. The open-endedness being, um, you know, not wanting to like lay everything out in this sort of central and like predetermined way, um, and the ideal theorizing being, well, we actually have these principles from which we can derive these institutional structures, and it's and it's very clear. So I was wondering if if maybe I'm I'm un, I'm misunderstanding, um, but I but if I am not, then I wonder what you make of that tension. If it's actually that problematic or if it's productive. Um, thanks. That, that, that's a fantastic question um, and doesn't misunderstand anything. And I think points to a, points to a very genuine tension there between on the one hand, I'm, I'm wanting to criticize rules for that open-ended, the certain, and, and, you know, the thought that there might be different kinds of, of, of institutional realization of principles of justice. On the other hand, I'm just doing it 20 minutes later when I talk about, uh, when I talk about sort of precise institutional uh, structures. So, um, nevertheless, I think I think it's an innocent tension and one that I can manage to navigate because I think it's all about I think it's all about the point at which um, it's all about the point at which the the kind of the role of the philosopher or the political theorist stops and where you just have to. Sort of say, well, look, this is going to be a matter for experimentation and for and for policies. And I think what ends up happening with with rules is it happens it happens far far too early um, in you know in in where he says, well, you know, property and democracy or, or liberal socialism, and that there's there's a huge amount more to be said by you know in in thinking about. Um, you know, thinking about what might be at stake in normative terms with regard to different sorts of institutional um, settlements. Now, now there could be the opposite kind of mistake as well, right? Where you where you sit in your armchair and you just output a precise institution. You know, where you know where, where you would end up. I mean, I, here's where I'm definitely with Marx. Um, Carol might be glad to hear. It, it's you know, it's it, it's. I don't think we should be. We shouldn't be like Fourier. You know, talking about the detailed design of, of, of the utopian socialist system and who does you know what job and you know what hours of work they'll be ordered. But I think again, there's, a, there's they a, live in which building they live in. Yeah, except, yeah, yeah, right. It, it, you know, what is it? The um, uh, the trash will be taken out by by kids because kids love getting dirty and playing with. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, but I think you know there's a huge, there's a huge, um, uh, you know, the, the, the potential, um, the potential sort of open area between, you know, just just wanting to kind of stop, uh, stop thinking in in uh, about the, the the sort of normative dimensions of institutions too quickly, and then not wanting to to go too far. I think that you know there's a lot of space in between there, and and I, you know, and I think. You know, for example, having a general account of the way in which, you know, this sort of, um, you know, an economy that has expanded public, expanded public provision, uh, some sort of collective capital institutions, but also, you know, some sort of private property free market elements, you know, you can, you can make a case for that. And I think you can even make a case much more, um, you know, in a much more, specific way about particular kinds of institutional types. So Stuart White and I have been writing about, you know, um, 
sovereign wealth funds and with a, a Swedish co-author, Marcus Forendal, we've been trying to look back at, at Meidner and look at some of these proposals around, around the wage earner funds and the, the, another kind of collective capital institution, another kind of, you know, sort of practical socialist institution. I think, you know, there's, there's a really important role for philosophers, for political theorists there in thinking about, well, you know, what's at stake normatively about, you know, what, what might be said for or against these kinds of structures. And I think that's completely consistent, even though there is a bit of a tension, uh, with not falling into the kind of Fourier type mistake of thinking that, that your job is to kind of output a, a detailed institutional structure. So, so great, great question, a uh, really good question. But I, I, I think, um, I think, I think that's a tension that, um, you know, at the risk of sounding like my, my therapist, it's, it's the sort of tension that one ought to, you know, kind of live with and inhabit rather than attention that you should try to, to sort of, uh, you know, send off stage. So. Um, okay, well, I, I'm going to just jump in again uh, with two things. First, on the, I, I just don't like looking at the Mondragon firms as on the side of private ownership, because I think that's a very good interpretation of collective ownership. It's, uh, it's still in a market, but it isn't, you have it in your little graph on the side of private ownership and that. And I do think yeah. one needs to reflect a little bit more about, about what counts as collective ownership and also how you incentivize even Mondragon type firms uh, within a yeah. market yeah. economy. Yeah. Um, but yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, just to agree entirely on, on that. I mean, what I was, what I was sort of taking, taking myself to be doing there a bit was kind of like in, inheriting the kind of you know the the, the sort of Rawlsian distinction uh, between which although he does put it slightly differently in different places where it seems like it you know that the idea seems to be between you know kind of private or state and, or, mm, and yeah, that's you, the problem yeah 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 but but I mean but, but it's precisely you know to say that you know that that something like Mondragon kind of it well it. It either, it either kind of creates a difficult kind of in-between case for that, or it just shows that, you know, that that distinction couldn't have been the one that, that you were actually most interested in, that actually, you know, the, the sort of varieties of different different forms of, of you know, public or collective ownership is, is, is you know, exactly, exactly the kind of thing that we should be thinking about. But, but that's exactly the kind of question that... that that I think liberal egalitarians in the Rawlsian tradition oh, yeah. have been directed a bit away from, right. uh, you know, because of, of some of the some of the kind of architectural features of of, of, um, of you know of, of the founding kinds of um, right. discussions of these things. And one more question about libraries. Let's focus on libraries a little. Um, yeah. So, you know, and it kind of intersects with Patricia's concern about the role of historical and cultural context. I mean, one could argue that you're, it's a kind of academic would come up with the importance of libraries. Um, so that just suggests, you know, the role of um, self criticism, ideology, critique of ideology, and being careful to correct for that, the kind of effort of critical theory that would necessarily supplement um, a, a, a principles account. I'm, I'm all for principles too. I'm, I don't go with a completely non-ideal, but that it needs to be at least corrected by or put to the test of one's own cultural preferences. This is not to diminish the role of of ideology, but of libraries. But I wonder no. if you've done enough of that with this particular preference that you have. But the other thing is in some ways it's not culturally updated enough because you know the, the things that you're arguing for for libraries really are a lot of people are hope could be found in the internet as a public okay. utility. Uh, clearly, the access to information part has been taken over to perhaps to the detriment of, of our beloved libraries by the Internet. Um, it, it lacks the communal, as we all feel in our Zoom isolation. Uh, <laughs> so far, it lacks the communal aspect of being together with others in a library. But anyway, those are just some reflections, both on 
the the importance of supplementing it with an awareness of the cultural and historical preferences that one brings to theorizing, and also with just this question about the internet. So, yeah, yeah. So I, I um, I, yeah, those are good. those are great points. I mean, I'm very sympathetic uh, to to both, and I mean, I suppose like libraries are such an interesting place, aren't they? Because the, um, I mean, I, I guess in the sort of, like the, the importance of, of like the public library as an institution, let's say, you know, it, I mean, certainly in the history of the British left, probably in the history of the left in a lot of places, right? The thought that, you know, that kind of the members of the community can like directly access these goods, you know, so I, I, I take, so, I mean, I take your point that, yeah, you know, of course, some, some bookish philosophy professor banging on about libraries is like kind of, it, it's like, you know, the, these terrible uh, it's sort of things where the, you know, the examples in academic papers are, are academic examples or examples from particular little corners of, of you know, bourgeois life. But I think, but I think libraries are interesting in that they are something that, that often, you know, uh, do get kind of picked up in, in the thinking of, um, of um, you know, socialist and some uh, social democratic political traditions, and you know, and they've been quite quite important there. Um, I mean, I, th I think you know, you're absolutely right about the internet. I mean, both both in terms of, you know, I think one very one very natural, you know, outcome of of, of, of this sort of view is to think that something like um, you know, universal free broadband provision as a as a public as a public good is something that you know that's the kind of argument that you could definitely make on similar similar grounds um i mean it's a public good in the, in the expansive sense and you know indeed you know the i mean the uk labor party went into uh went into the last election and i think the one before on on that kind of platform and i think you know liberal egalitarians or not to think of that as some exotic odd position that isn't right. isn't accessible or isn't defensible on their own on their own um on the basis of their own uh their own norms and commitments but i suppose the other thing then is is not so much to think about the, the you know the provision of the internet infrastructure as to actually think about you know the platforms that are on there so yeah. you know, thinking about you know is there a kind of collective or is there either a kind of public option or a kind of collective democratic option you know that displaces you know these uh, you know that displaces facebook or twitter or, or displaces uber or you know whatever it whatever it might be and, and they're thinking about what a kind of collective thinking either about what a kind of what the public option looks like there or thinking about what a kind of democratic collective option looks like there is you know it, again exactly the kind of territory that we ought to you know it's ought to be thinking quite quite carefully about I think. Well okay we've come to the end of our time and I hope everyone will will join me in thanking uh, Martin for a very stimulating exciting talk. Well done.